often when we're working uh, from an engineering standpoint or in a bio biological standpoint, we don't necessarily consider everything that we can do with the generation of our 3D uh, models or just simply the design considerations of our object before we get to the printer. And I'm not going to be able to go into all the deep theory involved in some of these modeling, uh, modeling aspects. But again, the goal here is hopefully we can talk about a few different strategies and a few different ideas that we can employ in our 3D printing uh, of, of a tissue scaffold. So the basic premise of the computer side of, uh, the computer and software side of 3D printing is that somehow we get uh, data from uh, medical imaging or we create our own CAD drawing. And whatever we do, we're generally going to uh, create some kind of coordinated controls out of that uh, model. Now, most of the magic happens here automatically through our software, so we really only have to be concerned about the integrity of the CAD drawing or the medical imaging data that we're drawing from. But it's really important to understand, depending on which printing process you use, um, it will drastically affect how, this, how your 3D model is processed and that will drastically affect things like resolution or some of the feature sizes and features that you can get out of a 3D printed scaffold. So that is one thing that we'll talk about. Uh, on the simpler side of things, when you're designing a uh, 3D printed model, you have to be really concerned about some things that um, you'll find very quickly uh, somebody who's printing for the first time doesn't consider, which are things like wall thickness. So if you have too thin of a wall, on uh, your printed scaffold or too thin of features, those features may not uh, print properly. So understanding the limits of your 3D printer is really important when you're just doing something as simple as designing uh, the 3D printed object. And if you design too thick of a wall or too thick of your features, uh, you can actually cause too much internal stretch, uh, stress, which leads to cracks or breaks if you're using a uh, harder or stiffer material. So again, these are kind of common sense things, but um, I, they'll drastically impact the, uh, the result of your 3D uh, printed scaffold if you don't, if you don't consider them. Uh, we're also, we also have to consider the file resolution. So most 3D printing software is gonna take an STL file and if you aren't familiar with what an STL file is, it basically takes a hollow shell of your material or your uh, model and it breaks it up into all these individual triangles, and that's how it knows uh, you know, what, what, what your file looks like by connecting all these individual points through these triangles. So you can see, you know, if, you, if, you don't, uh, if you don't care about resolution, you can end up with a very rough object that uh, is, is pretty low in uh, both resolution and data size. You can increase the complexity of that object um, all the way to a, you know, what looks like a very nice round sphere. But again, depending on the material and the printing process, just because you design a, use a file that looks really nice doesn't mean you're gonna actually be able to print that really nice file. So we'll talk about that later. And it can also demand, uh, um, it can also place a high demand on your 3D printing processing software. Uh, so you have to consider whether or not you can actually, actually, you, uh, your computer or your printer can accommodate a file like that. Uh, so again, it's, you know, it's, a, it's all about compromise. The software you use to design your 3D objects too can drastically affect the integrity of your object during your printing. So some 3D, pr or some 3D design programs actually uh, unintentionally incorporate a lot of errors into your object. Um, so it's really, important that you check to make sure that your, that your, that your, um, your surfaces are all complete, that by the time you process this software model, uh, your, your, uh, the software you use to transfer this file into your printer are compatible. You'll find that a lot of printing, at least commercially available printing software now, will actually go through all the checks to make sure there are no undefined joints or any open spaces that shouldn't be open spaces in your model. So hopefully that can be resolved on its own. But again, it's just something that you have to check to make sure that whatever object you've designed here is actually all the points connect, that you actually have a full, uh, a full, fully defined object. So 
there are two main ways that a lot of this processing takes place behind the scenes. And like I said, it's really crucial you understand how your file is being processed because this is going to drastically affect which uh, things like resolution or uh, things as simple as what the interior of your, uh, of your printed scaffold looks like. In this case, this is a kind of common algorithm that you're going to see when it comes to extrusion printing. So if we take, a, if we take this uh, bone model here, what's probably going to happen to our model is it's segmented up into individual layers. So right away you can see where we start losing some of that resolution on these features. Now in these layers, if we want to use two different materials, so say let's we're going to use a polycaprolactone scaffold to, uh, to support the strength that we see in a bone, and then we're going to include uh, cells in a gelatin within that scaffold, we then need to create two different tool paths uh, for, for our extrusion printer. And you can see what those, what those different tool paths might look like to then create a full layer. So this is going to happen for each layer. And already you can see uh, you need to start considering what the inside of that tool path looks like for the interior of your three-dimensional design. Because when you do design an STL object, you're just designing a, a hollow file. And you need to generate this tool path to actually make it uh, three-dimensional and make it, make it support itself. Uh, so like I said, you'll start seeing that these factors will affect things like mechanical strength or affect the viability uh, and function of your cell populations. And all this can be adjusted just by considering how you're designing uh, your 3D print and how you're using uh, tool paths within the 3D printing software. Um, more commonly in digital stereo, uh, digital projection lithography and stereolithography printing is this uh, idea that you take an STL file and then it creates a, an image file for each layer. So you might have you know, a pyramidal structure and even if you have you know, uh, uh, a, on flat sides, by the time it prints out, you get this kind of rigid structure because all it's doing is printing uh, layer by layer. So uh, it can be, you know, your, your limit at this point to your layer thickness is going to limit your feature size uh, when you're designing um, an object for uh, stereolithography or digital light projection. Um, if, you, if you want, um, there's actually a database of different models and different uh, CAD files out there now that are really well defined. So if you know kind of what material or what kind of porosity you're looking for, what kind of mechanical strength you're looking for, you can actually uh, rely on some of this research uh, that takes these kind of unit cells and then creates a, a, a structure um, based off of these individual units. So over here you can see how an object of the same size constructed by the same material and, and by even keeping things like the porosity percentage consistent just changing the geometry of these files can drastically affect the mechanical uh, strength of the resulting uh, structure. So when we're talking about things like you know, mechanical strength, and we mentioned earlier you know, how different material types, how different cross-linking uh, and exposure times are going to affect the mechanical strength, we also need to consider what our three-dimensional modeling software is actually doing to the, our mechanical strength as well. If you need to tune your mechanical properties uh, and get a, a better modulus than you're getting uh, through you know, your current printing methodology. It may be worth doing something as simple as examine, you know, examining the porosity and examining the geometry of uh, your scalpels themselves. It sounds kind of basic, but it's uh, really nice to have these libraries of predefined information to help guide your uh, guide, guide your material or guide your printing process uh, and design selections. And again, you know, here uh, I don't want to belabor that point too much, but you know, doing something as simple as taking one of these unit cells and increasing or decreasing the size can drastically affect uh, some of our some of our uh, properties like mechanical strength. Uh, one other aspect of 3D printing and tissue engineering in particular that we cannot overlook, and we'll see more later, is vascularization of our tissue scaffolds. So we're talking about printing often objects that are far beyond the normal diffusion limits of nutrients and uh, oxygen within our tissues. Uh, 
in order to support mature tissues, we have to focus on vascularization. Uh, fortunately, there are several papers and several libraries available that study the effect of porosity and uh, the 3D printing design on you know, what kind of uh, uh, vascularization you can expect once you implant those objects in, in uh, vivo. So, I, so incorporating porosity isn't just a matter of throwing some holes into your object and getting the right percent uh, porosity, but it's also examining things like geometry and the layout of those, uh, layout of those pores because that can drastically affect things like a uh, number, of, number of vessels that are going to start sprouting into your uh, scaffold, as well as the growth of uh, those vessels into the interior of the scaffold. You can see here, for example, just by changing the layout of your pores, how uh, through a simulation, what the vascularization into this bone scaffold might look like. So. Again, that's something that you can do before you even print an object. So you don't waste your time on creating this bone scaffold that's not going to support vascularization. There, are, there is software, there are techniques out there to simulate vascularization before you get to that point. Now, depending on the printing process you're going to use, since this is layer by layer, uh, you have to consider that the orientation of your object on your printing uh, tray is actually going to affect your mechanical properties, even if the material is, uh, is uh, using this, even if you're using the same material throughout your scaffold. So something as simple as you know, changing whether these scaffolds are lying down, what direction they're lying down, or whether they're standing up on the, uh, on the um, printing substrate can drastically affect uh, you know, our compressive strength and compressive uh, moduli on our 3D printed objects. So, once, once you've decided you know, what you're going to do with the porosity, what materials you're using, it's uh, worth your while to then uh, actually print a few of these objects in different orientations, which you can, you know, of course, change the orientation in your printing software to get an idea of how that's going to affect these mechanical uh, properties. Um, because you can see, you know, while you can adjust the mechanical properties through changing things like layer thickness, there's a very significant effect and changing the orientation of these objects. And that's going to differ uh, depending on you know, the porosity and, again, like the materials that you're using. So uh, you, you shouldn't limit your investigations to printing your cell scaffold or your bioprinted bio scaffolds in one direction and thinking that just changing something like cross-linking is enough to get the mechanical properties that you're interested in. So again, like I said, 3D model design should be taken into account. Uh, because a number of factors when you're designing your object do affect not only a successful print, but you can modulate the scaffold that you print drastically just by incorporating some of these ideas uh, of uh, intentional porosity, of intentionally orienting your scaffolds a, a different way. So I encourage you know, everybody to uh, look into, look into um, how you can in, um, model your prints and uh, design your prints deliberately to have some of those effects that you're looking for before you even actually print something with a 3D printer.